Howdy, everybody. It's a, it's a somber day, I guess, once again. <laughs> 2020 has been full of somber days. These, the, 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 these quiet before the storm kind of days, huh? Uh, welcome to a road reflection. I'm uh, Krish Mohan. If this is the first video you are catching of mine, that's who I am. I'm a, uh, a touring comedian, I, uh, but I have not been on tour because there is a global pandemic happening, and that is irresponsible to do. Uh, so, been doing a bunch of virtual shows, which are on hiatus at the moment, and a bunch of... Uh, you know, more like ranty videos, which is, which is what this is. So if you're, if you're a first time viewer, welcome. If you are a returning viewer, uh, hello again. Uh, there's just see three fucking turkeys just standing on a trail over there. <laughs> and it's, it's rather ominous. Um, but, uh, yesterday, or I guess, I guess when this video comes out, it'll be the day before yesterday. I'm, I'm filming this. I'm filming this on Wednesday. I'm releasing it on Thursday. That's that's the order of operations um, that I'm going with here. But uh, you know, Tuesday, election day, uh, and we knew that we weren't going to get the results, right? Like we knew that they weren't going to be done counting. A lot of mail-in ballots to process. A lot of other shit to process here. We knew that. That's that's something that. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people were expecting to be done and to to have a verdict by the by the end of yesterday, and that just wasn't the case, right? Uh, at the moment, I think Biden is in the lead, and he's in the lead with the Electoral College, and he's up by two points. Um, and uh, here's. Uh, let me preface this by saying that I have no dog in the race. There is not one candidate that is in this race that uh, I feel accurately represents me or even gets close to representing me. I think we have two very similar candidates from two very similar parties. Um, sorry uh, if the jacket is getting in the way. I'm trying to make sure the mic is not. But uh, I, I just don't have a dog in the race. My dog in the race right now is people, right? The the average Americans that are in this country, the people that are out on the streets protesting, uh, the people that are doing their best to, to uh, educate uh, the the nation about the uh, truth of, of the duopoly, the truth of what this political system is, what this economic system is, and why it is poisoning our planet and destroying um the world around us, uh, and amplifying those voices, amplifying those messages, uh, educating people about about all that all all that subject matter. And if you you know if you're a regular viewer of the stuff that I put out, if you have followed my stand up, then then you know I talk about this stuff on a regular basis. I go to cities that I shouldn't go to <laughs> to talk about this. On a pretty regular basis, right? Like my bread and butter is touring through the South and the Midwest, and areas where uh, they would call me a socialist as an insult, even though I wear that badge proudly. Uh, they would t- call me a traitor because I wear that badge proudly. Um, but I don't have a dog in this race. Joe Biden is, um, you know, equally racist and corrupt and, um, you know, uh, sexist as, as Donald Trump is. And we've seen this and what has been disappointing to me is the, the way that the people that are quote unquote on my team, right? Liberals, leftists, progressives have just kind of put that aside because they have this visceral hatred for Donald Trump. And this is not an excuse for Donald Trump. I don't like the guy either. Um, I think he's a buffoon. I think he is the epitome of what this, what, what, a, what a capitalist government looks like. It is a reality star that's gone bankrupt several times. 
Uh, that is that is essentially using the office of the president as a way to ensure that he is going to be enriched for the rest of his life and to make sure that his kids are are going to be enriched for the for the rest of their life. Uh, doesn't really care about the people that he claims he represents, but he is a showman. He is a megalomaniac, and Americans like that kind of stuff. The showmanship is what's going to is part of the reason why people vote for him. And he emboldens certain fears and beliefs that, that they have. Um, I know this because I talked to Trump supporters who wound up coming to my shows over the last couple of years. Uh, so I guess that's a good place to start, is what, what are we going to expect at the end of all this? Um, quite frankly, I don't know. There's a lot of people claiming that there will be a civil war. There's a lot of people joking and kind of excited about the notion of um, you know, a, a civil war and nobody should fucking want that shit. Nobody should want a second civil war in this country. Um, I know who does the people that, you know, uh, are due to profit off of any kind of war period, which is Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and Mike Pence and a majority of people in Congress. They, they profit off the wars. That's why they approve it. That's why Joe Biden approved the, uh, the Iraq war. So, you know, my, I, I, I've been saying this since 2016, uh, and, and I think this might be a good place to start. I don't, I, we'll see. Um, maybe I'll regret the fact that I started with this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I basically went out to, in 2016 and, and I said, uh, after Bernie was robbed of the election, uh, I'm not going to vote shame anybody anymore you know everybody kind of had their reasons to uh pick the candidate that they picked um and vote the way that they voted because they believed that they were doing the right thing for the country um and you know look at the choices that we had it was a huckster versus a warmonger and I, and I legitimately, at the end of that, I was like, okay, well, maybe this is the last of it, right? Like, we've officially seen the death of the Democratic Party, and we've seen the Republican Party go so far to the right that they're just neo-fascists. Uh, and, and now it's like they have to justify being openly neo-fascist. And I figured, okay, the, the Republican Party kind of accepting this brazen bold neo-fascist is going to mean that they're going to uh they're going to collapse they're they're going to kill their own party um and try to revamp for for 2020 i thought that's that's kind of what they were aiming to do and uh that didn't happen in fact they doubled down on it they doubled down on uh, on what neo-fascism was, and, and you know the the kids in cages, the police brutality. Um, they he, they wanted him to start more wars. In fact, even liberal media, when he uh, when when Trump would would bomb countries, when he would take uh, more aggressive military action, would call him presidential. Because that's essentially what the role of the president was: it was to expand the American military-industrial complex. And when he did, they were like, yes, this guy, fucking he's the best. Oh, we love him. Now fucking fuck Russia. Oh, man. They, if Russia put him in charge, then this guy, thank you, Putin. You know, like that's the way that the liberal media would treat him. And then, the, and then he would get bold and brazen and then he'd start spouting out, you know, a bunch of bullshit. And then they'd be like, oh, look at this. The fucking Russians made this happen. You should blame Russians. And that's what the left, that's what the, uh, the, Repu- the, the Democrats ended up doing, right? The liberals ended up doing is they kind of started de- de- blaming anybody else but them. Uh, it was anybody else but the party's fault, right? Uh, they blamed third party voters they blamed russia uh and russia gate was uh an, an a, a spectacular failure a bunch of hearsay uh with no with no smoking gun evidence and four years of uh essentially just reviving fucking mccarthyism 
to a whole new level to the point where you have uh, CNN correspondents coming out and claiming that a sitting congresswoman and a member of the uh, Army National uh, Guard is a, a major, a major in the Army is a uh, Russian plant with, with, uh, with, absolutely no, with absolutely no evidence to back up their claims. Um, so that's where the Democratic Party went, right? And that's, that was part of the voter shaming aspect of it, is let's blame Jill Stein voters. Let's blame libertarians. Let's blame anybody else but, our, but ourselves and our failure for running a, a corrupt, broken, untrustworthy candidate that a lot of people uh, couldn't take seriously because of her record in politics. And because of the way she carried herself throughout this election. And because of the fact that, you know, she... She would have indefinitely probably started way more wars. That would have been a, a given. Sorry, the sun is directly in my fucking eyeballs. <laughs> but... They ran a bad candidate. They, they, they rigged the election against the candidate that people did want. They went against what the people, the ideas, the policies that the people were clamoring for. And I figured, okay, well, the Democratic Party was going to realize all that, and they didn't, and they started blaming other people, right? So... Uh, you know, they started vote shaming anybody that was third party voters, and I and I, I couldn't vote in in 2016, right? I wasn't a citizen; I was still uh, a permanent resident. I was a green card holder in in America, so I wasn't uh, able to vote. And I still had lefties and fucking staunch Democrats and liberals come out and like tell me I got Trump into office because I didn't support Hillary Clinton. Just the near mere notion of the fact that I didn't support her got Trump into office. You, I was solely responsible. And I was like, I, didn't, I couldn't even cast a vote. And then it started happening all over again. Now, there were a few people that, you know, I could have the discourse with. But uh, for the majority of things, and, and I've, I've mentioned this before, is I think social media has a lot to do with what drives the conversation, right? Um, I think social media drives uh, argumentative and destructive conversations because it keeps people on the platform a lot more. Uh, I always try to keep things as civil as I possibly could. When insults start getting levied towards me, I kind of uh, don't particularly respond to the insult. I try to keep it to the facts. And one of the things that I wanted to do this year in terms of people that wanted me to vote for Joe Biden, because they, everybody, I think if you, I think if you followed my shit, there we go. I think if you followed my, my channel, if you followed all the stuff that I do and have been doing, um, especially over the last four years, you will know that I was a Tulsi Gabbard supporter and a Bernie Sanders supporter, right? That's, that goes kind of without saying. And uh, those were the two candidates that I was backing. I also liked Andrew Yang. As, and then kind of Andrew Yang started disappointing me a whole lot more, especially as we got closer and closer to the Biden nomination. Um, and I got attacked viscerally for it. Got Russiagate allegations thrown at me. I've got, I got uh, cult allegations thrown at me. Um, and, you know, a lot of anti-Hindu propaganda thrown at me. And... It's, that's a whole different other thing to go into with, with what's going on in India. And it's, it's a lot of research that I have not been able to do yet. Uh, but I know things are kind of fucked up with the BJP, who is a conservative party that's in lead with India. And I know that there were some uh, connections between Tulsi Gabbard and the BJP. And a lot of it was like people... It, it was kind of like Indian citizens here uh, formed a group that was like a non-political kind of group and they all decided individually to back Tulsi Gabbard not as a group but as as people as members so it's this blurred gray area and that's what people were saying is is her connection to the BJP and, and Modi and all this other shit and like this cult and all this other stuff uh 
but no one was able to. So so then they were like, well, you well, you know, and I was like, all right, I gave you all my reasons for why I support Tulsi and why your claims seem to be based on um, evidenceless claims that corporate media was is thrown out there, and uh, and you know it just levied with insults. Uh, and how I was I was dangerous to them, but also I was a I was a nothing and a nobody because I'm not famous. So my opinions don't really matter, but my opinions matter just enough to berate and belittle me and bully me into thinking in accordance with you and what 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 the liberals uh, were believing in in accordance with is basically corporate media, basically the Rachel Maddow's and the Chris Cuomo's and, and, and all of that, right? Like celebrity and fetishizing uh, these these pundits. And I saw this happen and then it kind of just geared up more and more. And the more I talked about Bernie and the more I talked about Tulsi, the more the more more kind of the people uh, on the liberal side that were either for Mayor Pete or Kamala Harris, or Pete Buttigieg, or, sorry, I already mentioned Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, right? Like, even calling out Elizabeth Warren for her baseless attacks against Bernie Sanders, which I really think cost her the election, because I think a lot of her supporters kind of looked at that and was like, ooh, this is a bad look. Uh, you have no evidence to back up your claims. You have a bunch of hearsay, and you're using hearsay as uh, undeniable evidence. And then once you kind of look at Kamala Harris and you go, wow, your criminal justice record is horrific like you laugh when you, there was a man on death row you put mothers you put single mothers in prison to try to uh, stop truancy instead of figuring out why these kids weren't going to school is there an economic or mental health reason why they're not going to school uh, top cop a nickname that you gave yourself which is just insane like who gives themselves that nickname that's that's like that's like frat boys going around being like they call me big dick dick like what because I have a huge cop. I have a huge cock. That's why they call me Big Dick Dick. It's like, well, who who said that about I did. I'm saying that about me. Maybe you shouldn't, though. Mayor Pete, no one mayor in South Bend liked him because he basically fucked over the black community in, in South Bend. And once I po- started pointing out all this stuff... Uh, People took the politics very personally, in term and and look, I, I think there there's a, there's a line where politics is personal, right? It is the way that you live your life. It does affect the way that you live your life. But pointing out the flaws and corruption of a politician is not personally attacking a particular individual. Like when people came after Tulsi Gabbard, I didn't take it as a personal attack over me. What I took as a personal attack over me was when they basically said that I was a cultist and a bunch of like anti-Hindu things towards me um, and basically justified like, hey, I think your thing is coming from, you know, a place of misinformation. Here's da 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 uh, The personal attacks on me, I would try to just brush off. But again, it became like this vote shaming thing started to, to, to spike up. And there was a little less of it during the primaries. Because it really just became... The primaries just became who can beat Trump. There's a lot of evidence showing that Bernie, Tulsi, and possibly Andrew Yang could beat Trump. You have a woman of color, uh, a Jewish socialist, and an um, Asian entrepreneur that, would, that, would go, that had, I think, the highest uh, chance of beating Trump. So, then we got to March. Tulsi and Bernie drop, and we got Biden. And this is when I really saw the vote shaming in effect, where a lot of people were like, if you're even thinking about voting for Trump, if you want to vote for Trump again. And, you know, I didn't... Again, I keep having to put this qualifier in place. I don't like the guy. He's he's not the fucking person I'm going to vote for. But neither was Joe Biden. Uh, and I'm pointed out with evidence about how Joe Biden and Trump are virtually the same person with the way that they they're using their rhetoric with their policy stances with their records with how they have treated women and how they've treated the black community um, and all this other stuff right 
and I got chastised and attacked more from the the, the left than the right. And I and when I would go after Trump, the Trumpers would just dismiss me because they don't give a shit about me anyway. But if, when when I would have a conversation with them, when I would talk to a conservative, and they were a Trump Trump voter or what have you. Um, I would look at them and, and just ask them why, right? And they would give me a series of reasons. And if I had a counter for it, I would give them a counter and try to have some discourse with them. Was I 100% successful? No. But I will say that I had higher success rates trying to talk to Trump supporters than I did with people, quote unquote, on my own side. Pointing out particular facts about the Democratic Party and Obama and Biden's records... Um, and basically saying things are not going to change, and Biden even said things are not going to change, was kind of like, they just kind of ignored it. You know, and, and it was, and it's Trump derangement syndrome, which is just, well, he's not Trump. Yes, he's not that individual person, but he acts and behaves like this individual person, just has a different fail on it. So I'm, I'm expecting that voter shaming to come back. And I'm not going to participate in it. You know? And a friend of mine brought this up. And, and there's a couple misconceptions, right? Uh, he brought up some concerns about... Look at the way that they treat the LGBTQ community, the immigrant community, the people... The, the POCs. Uh, and they've already told us they don't give a shit about us. And that is 100% true that a lot of Trump supporters... Uh, Diehard Trump supporters. A lot of people voted for Trump again because they didn't get, you know, they're pissed off about Bernie or um, they don't feel like Biden is the right candidate for them and they feel like the Democratic Party has let them. There's multiple different reasons, right? Nobody's, no voter uh, is, is entirely a monolith and recognizing why people vote for it and identifying the source of, this, of these problems and trying to figure out how to not repeat the mistakes is the key and you're not going to learn any of that unless you talk to people without trying to shame them about their decision and this is this is basically what i said to him that's that's key number one um you're you're not going to understand the way these that these people think you're not going to understand their fears unless you you do talk to them and and it's not going to be easy it's super fucking frustrating but the reason why it's hyper frustrating, why the frustration is kind of on an amped up level, is there's very few of us trying to do this. Um, and, and by me saying that I'm not going to vote shame goes for all the Biden voters too. It doesn't exclude them, right? So there's this thing where um, NPR brought it up and I addressed this in, in, a, in a longer kind of breakdown. There's this thing of selective empathy that you can only feel empathy and try to have understanding for, for people that you have deemed worthy of your empathy. And that's not how empathy works. Uh, it's unfortunate. But that's just not how empathy works. Selective empathy means that you don't truly have empathy. It's, it's this sort of faux, almost sociopathic version of empathy. Like, almost like, I should feel bad. Right. And and yes, some t empathy can be clouded by anger and frustration and disappointment and uh, hatred and all this other stuff. That is 100 percent true. And I have felt that as well. But when you get a little bit of distance, when you push past the anger, when you get through that cloud, you, you sit there and try to understand well, why would someone make a decision like this? <clears throat> Part of it is, um, you know, I was, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I was the first immigrant that my ex-wife's family met and like had a personal tie to, and they would always catch themselves on this weird anti-immigrant rhetoric, right? And until I showed up and I was like close with a family, I don't think they really thought about curtailing their language or having to like justify what they're saying so what does that mean that means that i think we live america preaches this hyper individualism so much that we literally can't understand the perspectives of other people other countries uh, why refugees are created how they're created why people want to come to this country particularly 
until it's happening directly in their family. That's just a reality of it. Now, how would you land on that conclusion if you don't talk to these people? And it's the same thing with the liberal side. The challenge that I've had with the liberal side is breaking through smugness and moral superiority. To, to think that what they believe and who they vote for is the epitome of moral superiority. And if anybody does anything against them, then they're beneath them. Um, it becomes like this voting hierarchy, this vote voter class system type thing. Where I think they tolerate me as a non-Biden voter, but they tolerate me because I'm also a non-Trump voter, right? Was I a non-Trump voter or, or a non-Biden voter, but a Trump voter? I think I would be in a in a lower echelon where they don't have to give a shit about me, where they can freely make fun of me, where they can say disparaging things about me and wish ill upon my family, and so on and so forth. But I want to listen to both of these sides. And say, well, why did you vote for someone like Joe Biden? It also shows me and gives me a little bit more of an accurate picture of where people are in their stage of realizing the corrupt nature of the duopoly that we live in. That's why I want to talk to people. That's why I want to figure out why you made the vote. Why you made the choice to vote for who you voted for. A lot of people are scared. I've talked to... And and what it really boils down to for me is... I go, okay, I'm an issues voter. I'm going to vote based on the issues. If you don't line up with my issues... or Or at least a good, solid majority of them then I'm, I don't feel like I can vote for you because then I'm lying to myself and I'm not going to feel good about it. And I'm already a hyper-anxious person. I can't fucking deal with that, right? So my biggest question to these people throughout the last six months, eight months, whatever it's been, uh, has basically been give me a reason to vote for Joe Biden that isn't Donald Trump. Don't give me the, the Trump derangement syndrome. Give me a, a solid reason on a policy and ideological level that I should vote for Donald Trump or, or I should vote for Joe Biden. See, I'm already getting them. They're, they're so similar. I got them confused. And every time I ask that question, no one has ever been able to give me a response. Not one fucking of my liberal friends. And then they'll throw words like straw man or hyperbole, or it's not true, and they'll just deny the evidence, right? I'm not going to participate in vote shaming, period, and that goes for both sides, because I understand that we were dealt a shit hand, and the goal for me is systemic change, Uh, and systemic change involves not being caught in this. So I'm going to advocate for more parties. I'm going to advocate for a ranked choice voting system. I'm going to advocate that you vote with your conscience, that you vote with what, with, with, with what candidate actually has your belief system in mind. And what does that mean? That means that we're going to have to get out of this mainstream conversation and you're going to have to start paying attention to other candidates. And I'll be honest, I didn't have the time this time uh, th- this year around to look at all of the candidates, right? In 2016, I knew what Jill Stein stood for. I knew what Gary Johnson stood for. I wasn't I'm, I I always veer away from the libertarians on 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 economic principle a, a, a lot of times. Um but again, it's not like I'm like, "Oh, I don't think we should ever have libertarians." Because a lot of people are going to sit there and say, you know, they're, I'm, I mean, I'm already getting, I'm already having conversations with people now as it is. It's been a fucking day and we don't know the results yet. Uh, about how the libertarians are, are costing Trump the election. 
uh, because the margin of error meets with the amount of votes that Joe Jorgensen got. And I'm like, that's not proof. That's not proof. You can't tell me that those voters would have voted for Trump if Joe Jorgensen wasn't on the ballot. And, and saying that and making that argument only strengthens the duopoly even more and only gives them the opportunity to throw worse candidates to be like, well, what else are you going to fucking do? The Democrats already did that this year. They threw uh, the Green Party presidential candidates off a lot of the ballots. Pennsylvania was one of those states. There were down-ballot Greens, but not on the presidential level because they're so scared they buy into this argument so much that the that they think that the Green Party votes belong to the Democrats, and they and it just doesn't. It's the same way like Libertarian votes don't belong to the Republican Party. So fundamentally, talking to someone that doesn't believe in the duopoly, that doesn't believe in this this spoiler argument that people have been levying for decades. And isn't America the country that preaches about how much choice they have? But here we are, an opportunity to put more choices on our ballots, and we don't take it. A friend of mine pointed this out, uh, that it would be very interesting if Trump won the popular vote but lost the Electoral College. And everybody in 2016 that talked about how they need to abolish the everybody in the mainstream that talked about how they need to abolish the Electoral College will flip sides and say, oh, well, we need to keep the Electoral College because it, it, you know, it corrects the mistakes of the populace and so on and so forth. And if that is the case, then guess what? In 2016, they corrected the mistake of the populace. They wanted a blatant fascist to be in place instead of a warmonger. I think we could have done, uh, you know, I I was thinking about it, and and I think we could have done a a, a lot more uh, in in terms of organizing and figuring out how to do the votes is you could have uh, you had a bunch of Bernie, Bernie folks uh, fill out ballots together so that people could talk about it, especially because we had the opportunity this year, right? Um, and, you, and you write in Bernie, you know, or you could have gotten a bunch of people together to write in Howie Hawkins, right? A bunch of Greens and New Greens coming together, and that could have been the campaign that you could have run to to write in Howie Hawkins so that he would have gotten more than like half a percent of, of the votes or something along those lines. I'm not a huge Howie Hawkins fan. Um, I think he's fine. I just think he's, again, he falls into that smug category for me, and I'm not a huge fan of that kind of stuff. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of an idea that I thought, you know, or, or whoever, if, if Jesse Ventura was the write-in candidate, can, uh, you know, you could have just gotten together and been like, "All right, we're doing, we're filling out ballots together. Uh, let's let's all agree on the president thing and and do it that way." And you know, if you got a couple couple thousand, tens of thousand people doing that sort of stuff, uh, and the, and then and then it was like, if the Democrats tried to stop that shit, that I mean, that shows you voter suppression. <laughs> Now, that's the other part of it, right, is voter suppression um, and and election fraud. Uh, We all know the Democrats did that in in the primaries. If you look at the exit polls, at minimum 8%, at most in some states was 20% against Bernie Sanders, uh, where the exit poll numbers just didn't match up, uh, you know, so with with what, what came out. It's a lot. Um... That's kind of proof that, you know, the Democrats steal the primaries. Uh, Now, the Republicans are going to pull their same old chicanery. Uh, You know, they're going to fuck with the mail-in ballots. They're going to do interstate cross-check. They're going to do all this other shit to throw people off the off the off the uh, the the polls. And, uh, you know, their votes won't be counted. And uh, they're, they're claiming record numbers, record numbers, record numbers. And then we'll see. We'll 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 see what the numbers stack up as. Um, you know, and 
we'll see the results of that. I'm not de- I'm not denying that there's definitely going to be a, a a bunch of fucking voter fr- uh, suppression and fraud election fraud. Uh, that's again cl- kind of classic. I think where we need to go, and this is an opinion here. Um, I think we need to stop putting so much pressure on electoral politics being the be-all, end-all of driving change. I think we've seen that uh, more, more, than, more than two elections now. Um, you know, there's talk of if Biden's elected, well, we can push him to the left. No, you can't. There's no evidence of it. On a historic level, there's never been an evidence of a corporate candidate being pushed to the left by anybody in Congress at all. You know when they do move to the left? is when there's a bunch of people on the streets saying that, yeah, we're ready to fight for our rights. We're ready to fight for the things that we want. We have been inching closer to a fucking general strike this entire time. And I think it's going to happen soon. That might be an interesting uh, response um, from the true left is to organize a giant general strike for 2021. Uh, like take the time now to kind of make that organization happen. I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not an organizer. I don't, I'm not very good at that sort of stuff. Um, I don't have the pull and uh, unfortunately I don't have the energy to do it. Um, but there are pr- people that do. And if, and if they are, then, you know, I'm, I'm here to fucking boost your voice. I'm here to fucking get the word out. And, uh, yeah, organize that general strike because what's going to happen? Police violence on peaceful strikers? We've seen that before. On the world stage, that looks really fucking bad. And let's say Biden gets elected. And we do a general strike or we do any kind of strike in, at all or a protest or demonstration or what have you. And it's coming from the left, not the right. And cops are called and those cops use chemical warfare the same way that they did when they were under Trump. Because fundamentally nothing's going to change with Biden. What is going to be the excuse for that? Probably fuck all, you know. No one, no one in the Democratic Party is going to say anything. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the results are going to yield. the The margin of the popular votes is very close. Uh, there are still a bunch of deciding states that need to, you know, tally up their votes, and they have a few days to do it. And um, we're going to see the same rigmarole again. Because I don't I don't think I don't think we learned anything from 2016. That's all of that hateful rhetoric. The anger, the frustration, the selective empathy roll back around again this time. very disappointing and uh, it has made me it has made me not give a shit about electoral politics when it comes to the two party system um, and, I, and I mentioned this on Twitter yesterday is uh, the only thing that does is a movement for a people's party and to see what they can achieve uh, through achieve on a policy level through organization by putting up a candidate that actually gives a shit about the people and that represents the people and that isn't a fucking hundred millionaire that got rich by, you know, get, 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 grabbing up real estate after people have lost their homes or bankruptcies or by fronting the fucking pharmaceuticals or supporting racists and so on and so forth. I think on a personal level, that's the direction I'm going to move forward. I'm, the movement for a people's party is really the only thing on an electoral level that I'm going to focus on. Um, I don't think Joe Biden is going to do anything if he becomes president. I think there's, regardless of who wins, there is probably going to be upheaval 
uh, it just it just depends on what what will be dependent on who wins is the level of police response to the protests. Uh, I think if Trump wins and there's a bunch of lefties, a lot more per, per, police brutality is going to be put forward um, on protesters. Whereas if Joe Biden wins, I think you'll still have police brutality uh, just on a lesser scale, probably, until it, until it becomes like lefties are involved, right? I think there will be police presence if it's a right-wing demonstration against Biden, but if it, if it is a left-wing demonstration against violent, uh, Biden, you will see a little bit more uh, violence from the police, uh, probably on the same scale as Trump, because, no, again, nothing is fundamentally going to change. Um, I, I've kind of turned off until I'm not really going to pay too much attention to to pundits fucking I mean I watched 15 minutes last night and it was literally a bunch of pundits going uh, this state too close to call North Carolina too close to call Georgia too close to call Kentucky too close to call and it was like fucking 15 minutes of this and I was like why are you even on the air you just need to be a jibber jabber machine. Like, what the fuck? And then watching Chuck Ch- Chuck Todd try to operate a fucking interactive map is like watching a blind, one handed baby chimp operate a crane. You know, you just watch it and you're like, ah, oh, somebody help! So get the get the chimp out of the get it out of the crane. Can can someone help the chimp, please? Give give the chimp a banana. So I think I'm gonna I, I'm gonna pretty much turn off from from electoral politics, uh, and and uh, and rank choice voting. That's the other thing that I'll I'll probably advocate a whole lot more for because I think we need it. Uh, but uh, other than that, yeah, I got nothing on electoral politics. It's pretty much very disappointing, disheartening, and uh, I've grown to I've, I think I've grown even more cynical about it. <laughs> In eight months than I thought I would. Oh, man. Uh, it's nuts. It's just not the be-all, end-all, folks. And and I think the people that treat it like it is the be-all, end-all uh, uh, of, of driving progress and driving change are wrong because on a historical level, it's people, uh, people that have been um, on the ground floor pushing for these sort of uh, changes that's... That's who have made politicians change their views. FDR was uh, not as pro-worker as one would believe. The Wagner Act was signed because there was so many general strikes in 1934. That's why the Wagner Act got signed. And then it was undone by the Taft-Hartley Act because Truman was like, oh shit, we're giving the people too much power in the workplace. And he sided with Republicans, the Democrats siding with Republicans. There's a whole crap ton of history that kind of proves that you can't push a corporatist to the left. You can't make a corporatist uh, work for the people because they just don't. They work for corporations, they work for private interests, they work to enrich themselves. And that system is what I'm against, and that system is what I'm going to continue to be against. Uh, so that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to keep doing. And uh, fo- hopefully, I mean, you know, I, I have been in a bit of a funk, and I'll, I'll I'm hopefully going to get out of that funk. So anyway, I'm going to bring this video to a, uh, to a close here and, and wrap things up. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, good luck. You know, stay. Stay safe and don't. This is easier said than done, but don't overstress out. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the same boat that you're in, most likely. Talk to each other, be kind to each other, be good to each other. Uh, take care of yourself, take care of those around you, and, uh, you know, yeah. You guys know what to do with these like, share, subscribe. I'm on Rockfin if you are not a fan of the corporate uh, technocracy. Uh, or you can find all my shit on my, uh, on my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. 
sign up for my email list, get weekly emails and updates about all of the uh, videos and podcasts that I'm putting out there and learn about my virtual shows when I get back to them. Uh, But till then, uh, thank you guys and we'll see you soon. Bye.